with us at Calvary Baptist Church this morning. So good to have all of the visitors here with us this morning. Good to see Matt and his family, John and his family. And uh, Matt remembers when we were taking duck work down through here when it was just dirt and gravel. And then Matt and Josh were here at the end putting flooring down for us. So we appreciate that so much. And uh, there is children's church that is going on. If any of the children want to participate in the children's church, and uh, if not, that's, that's, that's fine as well. This morning, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Luke, chapter 9. Luke, chapter 9. chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, I'm going to read from verses 23 through 26. We will word our prayer, and then I'm going to actually single out uh, one word that we'll pull from, and uh, we'll take our thoughts centered around that word. And uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke 9, 23, the Bible says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the songs that have been sung, for the fellowship that we've enjoyed with the saints of God, for the beautiful day that you've given to us, the opportunity to be in the house of God, and for the word of God that we've just read. And dear Lord, we're asking for help from you, sweet Holy Spirit of God, that you would take the truth that's contained within the words and make it real to our heart and life-changing. We're praying, dear God, that if there happens to be somebody here today that's not saved, they would get saved. And for every saint of God, child of God, Christian, that they would be encouraged through the Word of God. And most of all, that uh, you would be pleased. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and fill me with thy spirit and help me to be able to preach and teach the Word of God with truth, without any heresy. And as your word goes forth, that it would land on fertile ground and produce fruit in the heart and the life of the one that speaks and those that listen. Please have your will and way. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want you to notice in Luke chapter 9 and in verse uh, 25. It's a very powerful portion of scripture and for us to consider and think about. But in verse 25, you notice here it says, For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? And I'm singling out the word advantage. He says, For what is a man advantaged? And I'm speaking on this morning that thought the title is the advantage if you were to look up the word advantage you could look it up in the webster's dictionary and dated way back is the webster's 1828 dictionary it's a very good dictionary but in webster's dictionary it allows you to understand plainly what this word means the advantage the advantage from Webster's Dictionary is to be placed in favorable 
or superior position to success. The word advantage means to benefit or gain. The word advantage can mean a means to an end. The word advantage can mean to have prevalence over. And I think that we could consider that in the message this morning. And I'm going to preach on this thought of this word, the advantage. First off, I want you to notice this in the book of Job. This is in the Old Testament, the book of Job, chapter 35. Job, chapter 35. Job is right before the book of Psalms. And so if you took your Bible and you opened it up just midway, you would be in the book of Psalms. And so if you go backward, you will find the book of Job. Right before the book of Psalms, I want you to look at Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. But when you find Job chapter 9, fast forward to 35. You found the book of Job. That was to give you time to find the book of Job. In the book of Job, Job is having a lot of life difficulties. And he's being pressed out of measure. And uh, every, everything that he held dear to him is, is gone. His lovely wife is still there and suggests that he would curse God and die, of which he doesn't. But he has had great loss of his family, of material gain, and so forth. So he's having a very difficult time. And Job is a picture of patience, as the Bible says. And he teaches us that uh, there is suffering for good people. You know, Bad things happen to good people. And uh, good people suffer in this fallen world. And so it, he's having a very difficult time. And then he gets some friends to come along and help him. And he says that they're miserable comforters. They're physicians of no value. They're just not helping him at all. You ever had a friend like that? That <laughs> didn't, didn't help you. And so this is happening. Well, in Job chapter 35... There is a, another young man that gets involved in this dialogue, and uh, he is Elihu. In Job chapter 35, I want you to notice this, and in this portion of scriptures that we read, each time I want you to focus in on the word of the message this morning, advantage. So in Job 35, the Bible says, Elihu spake moreover and said, Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidst, My righteousness is more than God's? For thou saidst, What advantage will it be unto thee? And what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? Now focus your mind and thinking on it for just a moment. That this is Elihu, and he, he's speaking to Job. And uh, Job is a righteous man, and so forth. And God said that he was. And they have all of this dialogue back and forth up until this point. And so Elihu is saying to Job that within this discussion, that he has made reference to this or some type of reference to that. I, I want you to notice this. He says, what advantage will it be unto thee, and what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? I want you to think about that this morning. On the advantage. I want you to think about this morning the advantage of being cleansed from sin. Some people think that they have not sinned enough to think that they need Christ as a Savior. 
Some people do not think that they have sinned bad enough that when they stand before God, He won't let them in to heaven per se. It's probably the most often answer given today when you speak to somebody about are you saved, are you born again, and then you clarify, do you know for sure that if you die today you're going to heaven? And most often the nod it is, I hope so, or I think so. And when you drill down and say, why do you think that? They typically, and as of yesterday, would give me an answer of what they haven't done. And they're still, with, with all of the scripture, and with all of the preaching, and all of the gospel that's been being preached for these over 2,000 years, there's some kind of a thinking in man's logical thought pattern that when they get to heaven and stand before God that there will be a weighing of the balances of this good and bad and it's the furthest from Bible truth ever for every Bible believer here you know that that's the furthest from truth that's not true that's not how it's going to work and so they're having this discussion uh, back and forth and you, you can look up passages where Job is having a difficult time. He is distraught, talking about the burden of the day that he was born and maybe wishing he hadn't have been born, and, but holding on to his integrity and, and those types of things. And he's got bombardment from these kind of friends that are not helping him and all of this going on. And it's the fact that he had been uh, praying to God. He had prayed for his children and this type of thing take place. And how could this be that God would allow that when I'm trying to do the best I can? Bad things happen to good people. So he's having a very difficult time. And this gentleman says that he has said, what advantage is it if you get cleansed of your sins? Some people don't think they've sinned enough to meet Christ as Savior. Some people don't think that they need forgiveness of sin from a biblical standpoint. Uh, I'll, I'll hold my spot. It's not very far away. It is in Psalm chapter 73. And there is another individual that is having a very difficult time in Psalm chapter 73. In Psalm chapter 73 and in verse uh, 13, the psalmist comes down to this point with his thinking and he, he, he's thinking about uh, God is good to some people. God's good to Israel. And you could say, well, God swore he's good to my neighbor. I mean, look what all they've got. God's good to this group of people. I mean, their, their children are doing right. They've got a good job. They've got a house. They've got it all. They've got a, a boat. And they've got a four-wheel drive truck and they've got a motorcycle. They, that's not like it, doesn't it? You can sit and look at that. Nothing bad seems to ever happen. And then he says, but as for me, but as for me, you, you would probably never admit it, but you may have in your recesses of your mind say, what was me? What was me? I've tried to do the best I can. And look, that's what the psalmist is saying. And he, he kind of culminates when he gets down to verse 13, Psalm 73, verse 13. He says, Verily, that's truly, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. I'm back in Job chapter 35. In Job chapter 35, verse 3, he says, For thou says, What advantage will it be unto thee, and what profit shall it I have if I be cleansed of my sin? The word this morning is advantage. What advantage is it if you get cleansed of your sin? What advantage is it if you're cleansed of your sin? Well, first, everything in eternity. Nothing else matters on earth than being saved from your sins. I don't care what you attain to. We used Luke chapter 9 as the beginning launch of the text. 
And Jesus said, what does it matter if you gain the whole world? Okay? What, what, what would it matter if you gain the whole world? And there's nobody here that doesn't want some gain. It, it's instilled in you to desire some gain. You're working people. Praise God for that. And you would expect that there is a wages and there's gain. But he says in this case, what would it profit if you gain the whole world? You've got all the power. You've got all the prestige. You have, you have everything. You're the top. If you gain that for this spell of time, whatever that spell of time could be, well, what if that spell of time was a hundred years? Not many people live past a hundred years. Some do, but not many do. But if you died having owned everything, was the most powerful person with all the prestige, notoriety, what if you died after that and you went to hell? That's what he's saying. What, what, what if you gained it all and lost your soul? That's what he's saying. Then for eternity, it's not going to matter of what you had because there's no turning back after you leave this world. There's, there's, there's no change of mind after you leave this world. So what advantage of it is it that you cleanse your sin? That you are cleansed of your sin. Everything in eternity matters if you have your sin problem dealt with today. Today is the day of salvation. Today. Not only everything in eternity. That if you're lost, you get saved. So that you go to heaven and that you escape hell. But it's not just everything in eternity. It's everything in living today. What advantage is it if you be cleansed of your sin? Everything in your living today. Nothing else matters on earth than being saved from your sins. Nothing else is as important than knowing and living with yourself, with your fellow man, than having your sins cleansed and Forgiven. Elihu here is, is charging Job of making the statement that his right living for God did not deserve the trouble in life that had been permitted of God. D did you get it? You, you ever think, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this treatment. I, I don't deserve this. God, why? And Elihu is, is charging Job with saying, you're saying that your righteousness with God does not deserve what God is permitting. From logical, biblical thinking, does everything that come to you have to pass through the hands of God? I mean, help me. Does, 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 in God's providence, does, does God have to at least permit it? He does. I understand that. But bad things happen to good people. Job didn't know everything that was going on behind the scenes. And you don't either. You, you don't know everything that's going on. You and I embrace and feel and participate in the immediate. But you don't know what all was going on behind the scenes. But the New Testament gives us just a little glimpse of it. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called of God. All things, they, they work together somehow. And I wouldn't have done it that way. And you wouldn't have done it that way. And you wouldn't have permitted it. And the devil says, if God loved you, he wouldn't allow it. And Job is... Got all of this reasoning going on, and that and you caused this, and all these types of things. And maybe he was charging him with this, that saying uh, he basically got saved in vain. You, you were cleansed of your sins in vain. And the psalmist comes right out and says it. Hurting people think and say some things the way they do 
because they don't know all that is going on. But here's one thing for sure. It is the most important thing to know that you've been cleansed of your sin. Amen. You have the advantage. You have the profit of knowing your sins are forgiven. When your sins are forgiven, you become a son or daughter of God. Oh, he came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, as many as received the free gift, because the, the gift of God is, is free, and it's forever it's through faith in the Lord Jesus. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's the advantage of being cleansed of your sin that you become a son of God. It's the advantage of being cleansed of your sin on an everyday basis so that you have fellowship with God. Why do some of these things just keep happening in my life? It could be because I no longer have fellowship with God even though I'm a child of God. God was walking on this way and I started going over that way. And pretty soon I got over here and I can look around and I say, where's God in this way? He was going that way and you went that way. You remember in the Old Testament when they would encamp, whenever the cloud would stop, it meant stop. And everybody would say, well, we don't feel like stopping and unpacking and putting the tabernacle up again and doing all these things and so forth. So we're not stopping well, God stopped, and you didn't stop. God said, park here. You said, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not parking there. I don't really like it there. I don't like the scenery. I, I, I don't like having to go out and bend over and get manna every day. That, that's kind of like, I, I, I'm dependent on God. Yeah. But when the cloud moved, you were to move. And now you're okay because of human nature, and I'm not going. Do you see how we are? Being cleansed of your sin gives you the advantage that you have fellowship with God. The Bible says, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, help me out, <coughs> cleanses us from all Sin. A continual cleansing. It's a New Testament truth of the Old Testament fact. By the grace of God, if I walk with God, if you see the advantage, not just from eternity that I'm saved and on my way to heaven, praise God, but everything in living. How are things working out for you? Just help me out. You don't have to say, how are things working out for you? This morning, examine yourself. Have you been cleansed of your sin? Since then, how, how are things working out for you? When you're cleansed of your sin, you have the promise of God hearing and answering prayer. When you've been cleansed of your sin, you have the promise of peace with God. When you've been cleansed of your sin, it is the advantage. It is an advantage, a favorable position of success. It's a benefit. The one time event of getting saved, and I understand that from your sin nature, you've been born again, but it is a daily event of confessing and forsaking your sins after you get saved. The advantage, number one, of being cleansed of your sin. Have you experienced it? Here's number two, and quickly, if you take your Bible and go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. I know that you want the advantage, and you can have the advantage. Everyone can have the advantage. God is available to you this morning, and everybody can share in it equally. Romans chapter 3, I said, number one, what advantage has the Bible posed to us? Do you have a being cleansed of your sin? Sin is doing what God says don't do. Sin is not doing what God says to do. I, I believe that you're all old enough in here to understand what sin is. You can sin in word and in thought and in deed. And so we are all sinners for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
To be cleansed of your sin means to have your sin paid for. It's through the blood of Jesus. What advantages of that? It's in eternity. It's in the living every day. Here's number two very quickly. Romans chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 1, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God? For what if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Here's number two. I said in this thought about the advantage, if you get this, of being cleansed of your sin. Number two, the advantage of being in possession of the scriptures. What, what advantage is it that you have a Bible? Does anybody think that's an advantage that you, you have the Bible? That you, you have the word of God, the oracles of God that he's speaking about is the Bible. It, it's it's the, uh, the Old Testament scriptures of the time that were compiled and, and passed down through in the Masoretic text and compiled. And then the New Testament scriptures that were compiled in uh, Koine Greek or Common Greek, the Texas Receptus, and then all put together. And uh, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. And they pinned the words. And there were different forms down through the Word of God. And they, they, there are times of God they had scrolls and uh, uh, about 40 human penmen were used of God to pen the words of God. And over 1,600 years approximately, you now have a completed canon of Scripture from 90 A.D. on. And you can believe this, that that is the Word of God. And then he throws in this. Uh, what, what if some of you don't believe that? Uh, what, if, what if some of you don't believe the fact that the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable? All Scripture is God-breathed. That, that it's God's words, not just His thoughts. It's the very Word of God. And it worketh in you and it effectually worketh in you if you will simply receive it and believe it and act upon it, man, well, a life-changing event can take place if you would believe and act upon the fact that this is God's Word. He says, what if, what if some don't believe? Will that make faith of God of none effect? He said, it won't. Let God be true and every man a liar, but it may not have that positive effect in your life, and it won't unless you receive it as the Word of God. What advantage is it that you have the Word of God that not only was given by inspiration of God, but is preserved of God? Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Thou shalt preserve them forever. From this day forward, it is the very preserved Word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Forever settled in heaven. Let me ask you this morning. How settled is your life? How, how settled is the family? How, how settled is the country? How, how settled is America? How settled is the church? How, how, how settled is the, the schoolhouse? You know why it's not settled? Because they haven't settled on the Word of God. When you can look at uh, the Word of God, and it says, uh, in the last days, evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. And I mean, God forbid that a parent would allow their kid in elementary school or middle school to, after school, participate in the Satan Club. You think, well, there ain't nobody do that. Well, it's going on. You, you know that. You do know that. That there is now, at Lebanon City Schools, how far away is Lebanon City Schools from us? One hour, about an hour. Lebanon is about an hour away. And because they have a good news club that speaks about Jesus, they have to counteract that and say they're going to allow a Satan club. You say, that's bizarre. Well, it's taking place. Now, when they would say a, a Satan club or something, I thought California. I mean, really. 
I, I didn't think Ohio. But they now have that. What does the Christian do? Nah. To each his own. What advantage is it that you, you, you have the Bible? Did you take advantage of the Bible this week? Amen. Did, you, did you open up the Bible this week and, and read it? And study it? And meditate upon it? Or did you just simply say, God's good to my neighbor, but not me. God is good to Israel, but as for me, what advantage is it that you have the possession of uh, the Word of God? I mean, it's inspired, it's preserved, it's penned, it's the words of God, the promises of God is in there, the very heart, mind, and will of God is in there. It tells me who I am, tells me what I'm doing here, tells me where I'm going when I leave this world. The Bible is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but through Jesus, the scriptures, the Bible says, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. Jesus says of himself, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made, it was made. The Bible says in John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh. Jesus and the word of God are synonymous. Can't separate you from your words. What advantage is that, that you have a, a copy of the Bible? Let me uh, show you this very, very hurriedly. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and in verse 11, uh, I said this morning, this word that we're looking at is advantage. And, and, and praise God that we have the advantage of being able to have our sins cleansed. Praise God for that, that you have the advantage of being able to have a copy of the Word of God. Some people don't. Uh, now notice this in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2 and in verse 11. The Bible says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. This is being wise uh, to Satan's strategies. That he is in defiance against God. Uh, he, he was from the time that he fell. He is today. And he's ramping it up. In this defiance against God, Isaiah 14, 14, the Bible says that Satan says, I will ascend up or I'm sorry, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That's why he places it in people's minds to say, you mean uh, after school that people are taking the Word of God, the Bible, and trying to tell little children about God and about Jesus, how to be saved, and, and how to live a life for God. And how to build back America one soul at a time. You mean there, there, there's people that are doing that? Yes. And so Satan places in people's hearts this strategy of saying every place that you can mark down where there is a good news club, he says, I don't want a Satan club. And if you think I'm overdoing that, you look it up when you get home. Every place that they have a good news club to try to teach kids after school about Jesus, they want a Satan club. That's a strategy. And you say, that, 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 that's, that's far out. That, that's far out. How about just the strategy of the devil trying to deny God's word? Yea, hath God said, Under the tree of knowledge. Yea, hath God said. I know what the Bible 
Bible says, yeah, but. I know that the Bible says there's a real heaven and a real hot hell. Yeah, but. I, I know that the Bible says that uh, Jesus died on an old rugged cross. And that they buried him in a barred tomb. And then he rose again the third day. Yeah, but I haven't seen it. Bible's full of truth. But the devil gets you to doubt it. But yet they'll believe history books and evolution. They never saw any of that. Huh? His denial of God's word is provoking against God's will. I'll just read this to you because of time. First Chronicles 21, 1 Chronicles 21.1, the Bible says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. I, I don't think that strategy has changed. And Satan stood up against America. And then you can fill it in. Satan stood up against the gospel. Satan stood up against the church. Satan stood up against your house this morning. God hates that. God hates home. God hates, I mean, I'm sorry, the devil hates the, the home. The devil hates marriage. Uh, the, the devil hates the church. The devil hates uh, America for sending out uh, missionaries. Anything that God does, the devil is opposed to it. That's right. And if you would mark it down and just look at the strategies that, that he uses. Is America united or divided? Is America as strong as it was or weak? Is America vulnerable? How about your house today and, and your marriage and the home? And those are Satan's strategies. I'm going to give you a fourth one extremely quick. Go to Jude, verse 16. Jude is one chapter. Go to verse 16. Looking at this word advantage. You can look it up. You can, you, you can study this at, at home. In Jude, verse 16... Now, the Bible says this of Jude 16, and he's speaking kind of like in, in end times events as things are wrapping up, that he wanted to preach the gospel to them, but he says, uh, I'm going to pause for just a moment and say this, that uh, today I need to tell you what you need to do is stand for the faith. Christian, you need to stand for the faith. You're falling by the wayside. You're backsliding on God. You're falling for everything. He said you need to stand for the faith. And there is a group of people that are helping you fall away. And he says in Jude verse 16 of these people, he says, These are murmurers, Jude 16, complainers, walking after their own lusts. And their mouths speak of great swelling words. Watch this. Having men's persons in admiration because of, there's your word, advantage. This is being aware of the sinner's shrewdness. They sell it to you in sensuality. They sell it to you in seduction. They sell it to you with the loss of scruples. What they're doing is self-serving. They have their senses seared with a hot iron. Everyone needs to be saved, biblically saved. Everyone that is saved needs to be biblically wise in this world because of the sin nature and because of sinners in general that are trying to take advantage of you. And they want to take advantage of you. It's led by Satan, but it's manifested through sinners. Let's go full circle back to Luke chapter 9, verse 25, and I'll close. I've been talking about this morning of this word advantage. Now, in Luke chapter 9, where we began, we will close in Luke chapter 9, verse 25, in the advantage. There's an advantage this morning of having your sins cleansed. There is certainly an advantage this morning of possessing the Bible. There is an advantage this morning of being wise of Satan's strategies. There is an advantage this morning of being aware of sinner's shrewdness. But the advantage that I close with here is in Luke 9.25 where we began. And it is the advantage 
of being one of Christ's <laughs> disciples or a Christian. In Luke 9, 25, the Bible says, For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? There is an advantage this morning of knowing that you are saved, born again, child of God, on your way to heaven. And as we end, let me make it so very plain. If you say, through all of that, I understand all those truths, make it rubber meets the road, make it plain, and, and, and set it there where I can get it. Do you know if you die today, you're going to heaven? And then I would interject, how do you know that? Was there a time when you asked Christ, asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins? And by childlike faith, accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Are you trusting Jesus this morning to take you to heaven? Or do you have a misplaced trust this morning in something else? If you look at verse 23, there is an advantage of being Christ's disciple. He said, he said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. There, there is the advantage of trusting Christ as your Savior. There is the advantage of taking up the cross and following Jesus after you got saved. There is the advantage of unashamedly telling people that Jesus is your Savior. There is the advantage of testifying of Christ today to somebody else on how to get saved. There is no advantage of gaining the whole world and losing your soul. But there is an advantage of being a Christian this morning. The world will tell you different. But by the grace of God, it's the advantage. The advantage of the child of God is he has salvation in his heart. He has the scriptures in his hand. He has the Holy Spirit of God for his help. And one day he has heaven as his home. That's the advantage. My plea to you this morning is to take advantage of that. Would you take advantage of that? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't know how to make it any plainer this morning, but if you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you die, you're not going to heaven. I, I hate to even and, and, and say it and think it, but it just hits home. You, you've all read the story, and heard the news recently of a father and the two children. But they say that the father shot the two children then himself. That's the kind of world that we live in. It's so difficult. So many difficulties this morning. You do not know what a day may bring forth. If you're in the building, you've never been saved this morning, you need to be forgiven of your sins by accepting Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So if you're not saved, I plead with you to get saved today. And if you are saved, by the grace of God, you can see the advantage of it and take advantage of the Word of God of serving God and follow Jesus now more than ever. That's what we need. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God and the advantage that it is in serving Jesus. Help us all to realize that, dear God, this morning, to take advantage of it. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all.